Welcome back to the science track. Our second talk for today will be Debian, the ultimate platform for neuroimaging research from the neuro group. Michael Hanke and Jaroslav Falchenko from, what is it? Dartmouth, right? From America. From America. <laughs> okay. Thanks. So, thank you. Um, so this talk is about uh, letting you know that Debian is the ultimate system for neuroimaging research, in case you haven't noticed that yet. And the talk is going to be split in half. So I will present what we have done over the past five years. And then Yarik is going to take over and talk about what we are trying to get at. You know, not necessarily over the next five years, but sometime. In the beginning, um, just a few words, um, you know, who we are and Right now we are postdocs doing neuroimaging research of one or the other kind, and, but we have been um, more or less involved or at least using Debian for quite a while be, before we got into contact with neuroscience or neuroimaging research, but then we both happened to uh, you know, somehow have to get PhD degrees in neuroimaging on different continents and different universities, but the goal was the same. So, in case you, you never wondered uh, what neuroimaging research is about, it's about figuring out what happens when and where and why in the brain, right? So, you probably, if you, if you read those popular science blogs, for example, you heard about people figuring out what's the difference between Democrats and Republicans, that's us. Not the difference, but the, the guys who do this, that, that's us. So, and... Um, most of that type of research is done using a technique called uh, magnetic resonance imaging. If you're into skiing, you've probably seen one of those, right? And uh, so this, it's essentially a big magnet, a couple of times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field, like a couple of thousand times. And um, what they typically do is they make pictures of ankles and knees without having to cut people open. And if you turn the body around and put them head first in the machine, then you can also take pictures of brains, right? Without having to cut people open or otherwise torture themselves. So it's a completely non-invasive um, technique. And once you have those pictures, this is the anatomical uh, image of a brain, you can then use software to look at certain properties. So for example, there is software that turns this volumetric image into a surface, so it estimates the cortical surface, looks where it is, right? And then you have a two-dimensional thing that you can do analysis on and, and try to locate uh, certain properties of you know, what the brain does. And um, the second major way to use this technique is to not only do a snapshot of the anatomy of whatever is in the scanner, but also look at what it does over time. So here you can see the time series of one of these volume elements that people call voxel in, in that field. And you can see what it does over time. So there are three periods where it's above the average and periods where it's below the average. And then you can associate that with what the subject, the person was doing while the scanner recorded the data. And you try and figure out what has that to do with the, you know, what the brain did. And eventually you might be able to use that data and train more sophisticated uh, algorithms on it that, you know, from, from uh, computer science research or machine learning, for example, and tr make them predict what the subject had done at the time or associate that data or the properties of, that, of data from magnetic resonance, uh, resonance imaging with other um, data acquisition modalities like EG, which measures the electrical field of the brain activity. So, and with that, you could do a PhD in neuroscience, neuroimaging. And so this is pretty much what we're, what we were trying to get. And when we you know, were beginning that process, um, I had seen um, a neuroimaging research institute in Germany in 2002 that solely ran on Debian. And they did all their research and data acquisition on Debian. So I thought, you know, this, is, this must be it, right? You just use Debian, and then it's going to be you know, six, seven months, and then you're done. Could be. You know, you do the next step. But uh, when you actually looked at the, the, the state of the archive in 2005, 
uh, no surprise, there were, you know, there was a lot of support for general purpose software, like, you know, computing environments like R, which has been mentioned before, Python has been mentioned before, general purpose uh, visualization software. But then, those scanners, they don't give you the data as a, you know, comma separate value thing, right? Which you then could load into something, but they use dedicated data formats, and only two of them, and not the most, you know, important for that type of research that we wanted to do were uh, present in Debian. And worse, uh, there was few to no, no, you know, specialized application to do data analysis, right? Without having to develop every algorithm uh, or at least glue existing algorithms into an analysis pipeline. So it didn't work, right, in six months. So luckily we had people that tolerated us staying for a while in their labs. Because to do it the Debian way, you obviously need to go, look what you need, package all of that, right? Once this is done, you can eventually start doing research. And so we needed software for the whole pipeline of, of doing things, right? So you need software to collect the data. In that field, that's typically, you conduct an, an experiment, which is a series of visual displays or uh, people, you know, getting sounds played over headphones while lying in the scanner. That all needs to be done. And then you need software for data analysis. You need to read the data in the format that you get it from. And, and finally, you need to do something to be able to, uh, you know, to, put, to put in papers, right? You don't get the PhD without having published. So at some point, you need to document what you're doing. So you need to visualize. And that wasn't there, right? And so, but luckily, what we call upstream was active, right? And people developed software for all these things. And it was just waiting to be packaged, slightly simplified. And what I want to uh, walk you through is, is a simple example. No, it's not a simple example, but it's an example of an important uh, software package for, for our um, research. And you will find you know, many things very familiar because it, that's, most of the stuff is happening in other packages too. With this one, it's, it may be a little more extreme because it accumulates all the problems that, that you might get if you want to package something. So the example is, is a, a relatively um, comprehensive um, software toolkit for neuroimaging or magnetic resonance imaging data analysis. It's called FCL, uh, University of Oxford produces it. And its advantages um, are, you know, first of all, it's well documented. So you can, you can read the documentation, understand how it works, and they provide what they call uh, a feeds suite, which is essentially in, 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 in you know, distribution terms, it's a regression test. That's a very precious thing to have because whatever you do to it, you can run it and it will tell you if you've done good or not, right? And so you can, you're actually in a position to figure out whether you compile it and use it the right way. On the downside, it's, in Debian terms, non-free software. And it's, it's most of the, uh, not most, but a substantial portion of the, of the software that we have to deal with is um, non-free licensed because they have terms in the license that prevent it for use with uh, or in clinical applications. So the doctors may not use it to treat patients. In most uh, countries, this is forbidden anyway, because if, if, if a software doesn't have uh, passed a certain certification process, you are not allowed to use it anyway. But they put it in their licenses, which in Debian's terms makes it non-free. So we have to deal with non-free software. And other than that, it's very similar to other scientific uh, software projects. They have multiple developers. They come to their PhD, develop a piece, and then they go. And as a result, you have very heterogeneous code, right? So you cannot do grep and set something throughout the code and then you have to fix the problem because every single sub-project does it in a slightly different way. And mixture of uh, languages. They have a public mailing list, but they have no bug tracker and no public version control system, which is, it, it's puts quite a burden on, on the packager. So if you look at the actual content of what you can download is uh, you have free and open source software. That's uh, their visualization tool. Uh, 25,000 lines of code, and uh, it's, it's GPL license because it depends on Qt, 
which is nice. And the rest is non-free, as I said, non-clinical and uh, non-commercial in that case too. And it's 160,000 lines of code, so it's quite, quite a bit. And at some point, you know, uh, looking back at the past five years, uh, it only had binary-only stuff that, of course, it's, that's a no-go and you have to strip it. Fortunately, it wasn't that important and got replaced. And as usual, they have convenience copies of a lot of stuff. And because they have been convenience copied quite a while ago, they are outdated. And then at some point, it was easier to modify the copy than the original. And so there was, there's diff and you have to take care of that. Something Debian right now doesn't yet cope very well with is the data. They ship about a gigabyte of data packages, which are, not all of them are essential, but you know, if, you, if you use it for certain purposes, then you need them. And there's, there's right, now, right now no way to do it. And we're waiting for data, data.debian.org to become available. And in 2005, we also had um, things that would have to be packaged um, before FSL could go um, into Debian non-free and FSL view into, into main. So just a quick summary of what, what that packaging meant in terms of our um, biography. <laughs> so so the, the whole thing started early 2005 and then 2005 in October, um, there were pre 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 preliminary packages ready that scientists could actually use in their research, right? So this is about the point where you think it's, it's, it's valuable. And upstream was quite happy to, to see that packaged and they, they also agreed to support it, which is a, it, it's a very good thing. And then uh, one after another, the, um, the essential dependencies were packaged, unfortunately by other people than, than us, which, and now libvdk, I don't know if you, if you do visualization stuff in science, you probably have heard of vdk. That's now an essential library. The half of the visualization uh, stuff depends on it. And then uh, we, we added the uh, essential uh, data format libraries. And finally, about two years later, the first component of FSL got, got uploaded into Debian, primarily because at that time, Yarik became a Debian developer, and the, the problem of asking for a sponsor for that package wasn't existing anymore. And uh, again, a couple of months later, FSL got uploaded to Debian, and we are now, at this point, um, still waiting for the data packages. So the, the whole suite, even after uh, five years, is not completely usable just using Debian sources, because about a gigabyte of information is missing. And uh, as well, the, the regression test suite is packaged, but it hasn't been uploaded to Debian because it's, it's again, quite, quite heavy. So, First conclusions um, that I want to draw from this is that we, for us, needed to have a, a, a separate repository from, from separate from the main Debian archive because we had the package ready for a couple of years and we would not have been able to you know, let, you know, make people use it without having a separate repository, which is quite easy step. Nowadays, we also use it to provide um, backports of everything that we do backports to stable because that's where, what we run on our cluster and all the mission critical uh, machines, but also uh, backports, and they're all backports essentially, to Ubuntu because most Debian users run Ubuntu in, in our field. And, but we could not stop at that point because otherwise I probably wouldn't have been here because we would have given up by now because you, you, you simply cannot, cannot do this for a larger number of packages if you have to do the building and testing and everything all by yourself. And by pushing it into Debian, you get access to all the people who do the QA work and they do it for you. And, and, and any package that goes in there, it's neuroscientific research uh, software, is no, other, no, no different from any other package, get tested the same way. And that's, that's a very uh, valuable thing. And then, of course, we get Debian infrastructure for free. That's something we could never re-implement re or, or, or even buy ourselves, right? And that's, that, that's why, um, it needs to go in there, and of course it's visibility. Not everybody knows about our secret um, repository, and once it gets into Debian and, and, and eventually in Ubuntu, people will know about it. So after five years, uh, it looks pretty much um, like this. This is the status of uh, 2005, and now we pretty much have a neuro Debian, right? It's the, the system that you can simply install Debian and you, you can 
yeah, from that minute on start doing uh, neuroimaging research, and because we have a lot more support for uh, general purpose packages that are very useful in neuroimaging research. We have batch queuing systems, and not only one, we have a couple of um, critical libraries. We have all of R, we have tons of Python. And in addition, we have the most important neuroimaging data formats supported by, by libraries. And we have a ton of um, special purpose um, neuroimaging research uh, packages. And we have more coming. So that's about the state of, of what we have. Oh, so other than that, that's all in Debian and not in our, it's, the backports are in our repository, but this is, this is what Debian has right now. And this is what w it will get. But there are licensing issues to figure out and they will eventually take um, 10 years. So who knows? And so the second conclusion I want to make is we need, we need a tailored presentation. It has been mentioned uh, before that you know, the Debian archive has a lot, but people just don't know, right? And there is, um, if, if somebody is supposed to do research in that field, they would ask, okay, what, what do they have for me, right? They don't, they, they don't just decide, I want to use Debian, and then you look whatever is Debian has, and that's your limited set of what you want to do, right? It's the other way around. They know what they want to do, or need to do, or to or told to do, and then they look what environment is useful for them. And on the other hand, uh, they want to know whether there is, it has been just uploaded one time and now it's outdated and, and, and bit rotten at some point. But they, all, you know, they also want to see that it's actively maintained. So there is somebody there that cares for them. And especially the guys who develop that kind of software, they want to know whether we are serious, right? That we acknowledge uh, necessities in the scientific world, they, that we properly reference, right? And allow them to get... Um, to justify their, their funding, right? Because all of them get paid by some governmental or whatever agency, and they need to document, okay, where did that go to, right? Is that popular? Is it used at all? Do you have two users or two, 2,000? So, and we've seen that before in, in the talk, and the, the uh, Debian Pure, Dem, Pure Blends developers have done a great job of presenting what is in Debian in a, in a, in a way that is useful for scientific purposes. So you have, you know, if you, if you go here, you can, you can see screenshots, you can see the number of bugs, you can see the translations, you will find links, right, that you can click and register voluntarily, right, to tell the developers, yes, I'm using this, count me on your list for justification of your grant. And you find the, the canonical references that you put in your papers, if you, if you cite them, we'll talk about this later on. And you, they will also, it, it will also list packages that, that will become available or are unofficial right now, and the reason why they are not yet in Debian, right? If you go to that page, you'll, you'll see a lot more. This is just a, a sketch. But if you go here, and we can do a little quiz, where do you have to click to get to that page? On all. Huh? On all. Yeah. Where, just, does anybody know? Developer corner. Developer corner. He knows because he clicks on it all the time. Yeah. And so, so what, what you need to click on is here or there. Right? So every user first has to realize that there are developers as well. And then they can click, and then need to scroll down a couple of pages, and it needs three additional well-placed clicks to get to that page, but you'll eventually get there. So, so it's unnecessarily hard to discover what is in Debian, how, how versatile it is. But as we all know, the, the actual information is easily available. We have UDD, we have DDE, we have the Pure Blends task files maintained by many people. So the information is there, it's just not people seem to have trouble you know, realizing <laughs> where it is. So, but we, you, can, you can easily take that information and generate a tailored view of the Debian archive for your purpose. And you can do that without adding, adi adding any uh, information that is not available in, within Debian. So what we do is we generate something that is available on the neuro.debian.net and we give it a fancy name, it's called NeuroDebian. People feel home because it's called NeuroDebian, right? It's, it's a very easy thing. There is no NeuroDebian, actually, because it's just Debian plus this repository with backports, but people feel really nice. And so we take information from UDD and DDE, and we have a Twitter account, and that's pretty much it. And we, we link with a, a portal, which you are going to talk about, so I'm not going to talk about this. And for an individual package, it looks like this package description, then goes to the upstream homepage at first, right? And then to that other portal, to the uh, respective entries in Debian Met and Science, then the canonical reference, then the register link. And then we have, we aggregate popularity data from Ubuntu and from Debian and from that 
uh, neuroimaging tools and resource clearinghouse, and then you get a list of all the binary packages that, that are available. People just can just click, they get the sources, the entry, and then they, they are set. So, and was that anyhow good what we've done? So people use it. This is a plot of over the last um, three years. Popcorn Debian, you'll see it. So this is the actual popcorn count here, there, 300. So it's not X and not VI, right? But there's, there's some trend. You see that big bump. That is what happens if sizable cluster gets installed and has popcorn avail, uh, and enabled. And you see that there's, there's general trend. But we, we, as I said, we not only have Debian, we also have other derivatives, so we need to put that a little into scale. And we, then we can, we don't have as much Ubuntu data as for, for Debian, but this is the, it's the same plot of Cochon values uh, for Ubuntu. And what I want to draw your attention to a little piece, that's this little rocket launch there. That's what happens if a package that's already uh, available in Debian Unstable hits a release in Ubuntu. Right? So th th this is visibility. Right? People just realize, oh, look, and then they install it, and that's, that's what happens. And Debian's last uh, freeze actually is here. And so if we, if we, if we look at the data, we, we estimate that about 1% of all the people who do neuroimaging stuff of some kind as um, implemented as they have some package which only makes sense if you do neuroimaging research, right? Because we, we don't, our packages don't get pulled by dependencies of general purpose stuff. It's about 1% of the people who submit popcorn to Debian, right? And if we ask that, neuro, so I, I finally have to say something about it. The neuro, neuroimaging tools and resources clearinghouse is a portal sponsored by the US government that aims at providing or listing any uh, neuroimaging software project that there is. Right? And we, we ask them what is, what is, what is your, the rate of, of Linux users, and they say 15% of, of the people who come to our page and download stuff do that from Linux machines, and about 50% of those are Debian derivatives. So that's not enough for all the work that went into it, right? And Jarg is going to talk about how we can change that. Right, one, hey, I'm here. Okay. Um, so you saw already first intermediate conclusions we draw and what needs to be done so we draw more attention to our project. Well, we need to let people know, obviously. And we cannot know just within Debian community. We need to know we need to let them know at the specific scientific mailing list where those people hang out, right? or it's actually useful maybe to present at native conferences where also those native people hang out, right? So we did that. We went with our little NeuroDebian poster uh, to Cognitive Neuroscience Conference not far from here in Montreal. And it was quite a nice experience. First of all, it was really pleasant to realize how many people are struggling there. And when you describe them, oh, you can install any software for your needs with one command, apt get install, they got really amazed. And one lady from Florida, uh, she told us her, her story, how she had to hire a sysadmin and he enforced Mac OS X solution to her and now everything goes just slow in that lab. So we are not only providing seems to be the tools, we are just letting them even to be assimilated in the field so people can use different tools without any hassle on the same system. That's why to deliver the message even to bigger audience, we want to um, present ourselves at Society for, Neuro uh, for Neuroscience Conference, which happens this fall. And since probably you are not also native audience for that conference, I'll just, I just want to let you know that it's around 30,000 people attend that conference. It's huge. And there is lots of lots of commercial companies. There is lots of agencies from the governments. And hopefully there will be Debian which will be somewhat a precedent in, in those terms. And we need to not only let people know that we exist, but we also want to give them easy way to try it. Right? And that's why from NeuroDaemon uh, website, we provide a virtual appliance image for uh, which could be used on VirtualBox, and it made people really happy. 
This is uh, reviews uh, from Nitric, the, the same website portal. It provides ability to review the projects, and quite a few people were thrilled. Moreover, we've used that um, image on our little workshop at Dartmouth for Pivine VPA users, and we ran it on 16 boxes without pretty much any hassle. There was a little bit of heterogeneity in OSX itself among the boxes, but otherwise it was really fine. There were no, literally no slowdown in, we, we did real computing, and it was really nice. And with seamless mode in VirtualBox, it becomes just an experience that you have those tools available on your native system. They don't even, might not mention that this is running Debian. So we let people know and actually let them try, but there is a little bit more what we need to worry about. We need to work together, and this is what we realized after all those years, and you've heard already success stories when things start to move whenever you talk to upstream, right? Whenever you find a way to talk to upstream and to persuade them that they can get something from us and we will benefit for sure if they start listening to us. So let's think about Debian as the city. And maybe it's a little bit side away, artistic one, but still. So it's a city, it's an um, ecosystem which is, construct, uh, which is constructed by people and sometimes they achieve really nice results, really nice buildings and which are constructed, engineered, and they're just natively part of the city. Sometimes there is also software. Well, it might be state of art, it might be actually well engineered, but still it's, it's really hard to put it into this, into this common picture and that's why we struggle again, again, people, to still be in Debian with all those tools and it's not just the city and the buildings, it's us and the software. And when we come back to this kind of somewhat ugly looking house and maybe summarize once again what aspects do we see often in scientific free and open source software. Maybe it's not dominant in uh, scientific free and open source software which developed by companies, but it's really common in the education. Many projects, they are developed by one person or maybe under one person's supervision and then people rotate within a few years so there is no consistency in the code development or even how the project is organized. And very important also that people often don't realize how they have to expose their projects what licensing, licensing terms to put, what copyright means at all. And they don't have power to support the project. They are really eager to present the method so they could be assimilated within the field, but they are not presented well. So methods are not assimilated and project just dies. But we want to present Debian to them. How can we present Debian if Let's say some people, although the whole article or blog post was quite positive for free and open source software, but this sentence choked me. It's so great, it's so useful because if I change a few words, it becomes our goal okay? to describe how to describe Debian in one sentence. It's great. Well, if we attenuate it a little bit more, I want to say that it's ecosystem because it consists of software and people. It's not just software, it's not just platform, it's us. And we have clearly defined standards, best of breed capabilities. We have integration, we have maintenance infrastructure and actual communities to support it cost effectively. Well, cost effectively it's usually zero plus some hour efforts. But then we also see that those standards may be a little bit heavy on people. This is what John Pierce, PsychoPy guy, said uh, in some private com com communication that Debian packaging is rather more involved. You have to read whole books on Debian policies. Why do you think he thought about this way? Then he pointed me out to Debian New Maintainer's Guide. Chapter one, getting started the right way. Well, Debian policy, sure, you probably need to read Debian policy once in your life, regardless of either you're involved with Debian. Developer's reference, it's, it's a good thing, but the appropriateness for starting the right way is already kind of aside. 
What would be your call for the next one? <laughs> so it gets a little bit hairy, right? But nevertheless, we do have standards. We have constitution, social contract, and Debian free software guidelines, which are really, really important documents. And as such, especially Debian free software guidelines, they provide us, they make Debian more than just a platform distribution. They provide upstreams with legal assurance clearing house. This is how I would put it. Because FTP masters, they're just, this is their food, right, to find something which is not properly mentioned Debian copyright. And to get package right, you, you need to go through all this interaction with upstream to remove some um, not matching co um, licensing, and it, it's a lot of work, and we are doing it for free pretty much for upstream. Moreover, Debian policy assures that, we, um, that the projects, they comply with common standards which are present in the field. And um, moreover, it provides uniform and robust deployment across different platforms and how packages behave in their real life. And there are even more standards we have, which are maybe not so official, maybe there are recommendations, but still, we have standards. And that actually leads people, upstream sources sometimes, it's upstream developers to say that, ooh, that's great, we'll try to follow those Debian guidelines when we work on new version of the product. So I think it's kind of one another successful story. And we do have capabilities, you saw this picture. We have a lot to um, provide for users and for developers. We have all kinds of um, programming environments. We have different base libraries they could use. And then they don't have to come up pretty much with this hairy structure of their packages where they provide all externals they need for their project. Oh, that's another anonymous reviewer. They are just thrilled to use it whenever they realize that it's there. And integration infrastructure. You've already heard about many things, and this is what we're delivering for upstream. Now they can benefit from binary builds for 12 architectures. Quite often, if project, even if it claims that it's uh, architecture independent, the code is nice, they don't have means to try it across different architectures. And if the packaging is right and they provide unit tests, we easily assure that. If unit tests fill during the build on some interesting architecture, we inform upstream. Upstream never can have such facility in there at home. And we provide archiving delivery, which is really important also because we just deliver this software for free across the world, multiple mirrors. It's really easy for upstream. They don't have to do anything about that. And we provide support. But it's not only support that we are supporting users. We are not there to actually support users in terms of educating them how to use the software. We are there to provide proper deployment. We are deployment experts. We ship software to people and we take deployment burden away from the upstream. I think it's a huge plus for them. They don't have to worry about all these questions on the mail list or bug trackers that something went wrong on his system, on the user system. And we are also usually people who use this software. So we eat the same stuff, right? So we encounter the same bugs quite often. But moreover, besides this support we provide to users, we are providing support to upstream to some extent. This expertise transfer of what we've learned by looking at more than one software product. We are looking usually at many software products. We realize some common patterns in how code should be organized, how it should be installed, and we sometimes know tricks which one specific person from some computing lab might not know. So we're providing this exchange of ideas, and many projects in uh, education, which come from education, I think they desperately need that. And see, even those who are experts in their field, they think that even if we provide all those kind of hints and we buzz them too much, it's still useful. And to kind of absorb this all in, in one another document, we started Science Deployment Guide, which gives little hints 
and we are welcoming contributions and discussion on this regard. So we have standards, capabilities, integration, infrastructure, and support, and people. So together, it creates this distribution ecosystem in which we have people, all those little dots. We have upstream development, which might be more closely connected to Debian whenever maintainer of the project is also a developer of the project, which is ideal situation. And there are some disconnected projects. But as you see by those old lines, those people who deal with Debian through the maintainer, they don't have to care about deployment problems, which are deployment is blue, right? And they just have to deal with those problems with other operating systems. Just nice picture to kind of put everything together that we have also different teams within this ecosystem and we interact among each other and with projects. Oh. So, conclusion. Debian is the ultimate platform for neuroimaging research because it got electronized. Well, that's wrong message probably. Maybe in 200 years, I think that was, that will be about right, but the main conclusion probably will be the same sentence, that we do provide this robust system and actual X system of us developers and all the software which we provide. And Debian is so rich and versatile, and if you care, you can make it tailored towards specific domain, like we did with NeuroImage and NeuroDebian portal. And it provides really robust deployment. People, this is what also I expect is important for scientific research, that you need a stable system. You don't want to run unstable. That's why part of our kind of duties when we package something is to make packaging easily or transparently back, backportable. So we don't need to patch it to make backport. So we just can build it for many systems, they've been derived systems without any hassle. And that creates really, really nice system where the core is really stable, it's Debian stable, everybody knows that it's stable. And just scientific software, it's bleeding edge, but it's there in a stable environment. And we try to work with upstream. So what could be better? It's ideal platform. But we need to do a little bit more. We need to have better coverage of neuroscience software. At the moment we are concentrated on this neuroimaging, but there is zillions of other tools which are used in other fields of neuroscience research. Although we have targeted web presence on our website, I still think that, or we still think that it would be beneficial for Debian itself to come up with some design of, uh, and appearance on the web where it becomes more prominent that you don't have to go through three links to get something of interest for you. And release notes for every, uh, let's say even task in um, blends, we can easily craft release notes for every upcoming Debian release which are tailored for specific domain of interest. So people know what kind of new software comes into Debian for their interests. That's another aspect we need to worry about. Sometimes people need to have multiple versions of the same software installed because maybe they analyze data with previous version and they want to replicate the results, or maybe they want to replicate somebody else's results which were done with the same version. So that is also aspect which we want to keep in mind. And um, the software FSL which you've seen already, it's on the way to come up with version, multiple versions packaging, although it's such a humongous one, but you will be able to install multiple versions at once and alternate between them. And everybody already referenced that we need um, ways on how to reference the works. So for that, come back in 10 minutes when we have next session. And means for reproducible research. Either we provide some version control facilities or we just advocate on how to use virtual machines in snapshotting. That's the easy solution they could do and it works. They snapshot the system when they publish the paper Later on, they need to reproduce, it's there. They just take that snapshot. And large data packages, once again, and extended quality assurance. 
We don't have any infrastructure to do regression or heavy testing. We try to put some testing while building, but it's not a solution for, let's say, FSL with its huge battery. And it would be great to run it on multiple architectures. And, of course, we need further to disseminate Debian around the world. And if you want to contact us, and we want to express our um, gratitude to other teams within Debian and our advisors, Stephen Hansen, James Hexby, and Stephen Paul. And I'm done. Thanks a lot for that great talk. I think it's really great that you all go out and, and to conferences and then push that stuff. That's really something. One so far. One, one so far, time. but <laughs> apparently we'll go a second time. And I think that's, that's, really, that's really a great thing, which really will help in the long term. Any questions? Thomas, can you stand up, please? So you're mostly Norio scientists, or did you also get to become Debian developer or the Debian maintainer? Uh, or you are just Debian user and do a lot uh, in promoting Debian in your environment? I'll just answer for us both. Um, we have different stories entirely. Uh, Michael is a psychologist. I'm computer science by major, and we do neuroimaging. So, which is also not psychology, not computer science. And uh, Michael is a new maintainer in new maintainer queue, but he's bored with that stuff, sorry. So, and he has me. <laughs> All the stuff goes through me into Debian anyway. Uh, You're a Debian developer? Oh, yes, yeah. yeah just, just to make sure. So, I'm in new maintainer since the <laughs> middle of 2007. <laughs> but there, there wasn't much time left other than that to get through it, so eventually, maybe. Further questions? Yes. Um, yes, I was just curious about your use of VirtualBox and VM snapshotting. It seems to have lots of applications, and uh, whether or not you would use that to maybe not circumvent, but uh, increase the uh, freshness of what's in Debian. <laughs> That is, would you consider snapshotting off of testing or something like that with versions of, of your latest versions of your packages? Oh, oh, oh. That's, so you mean snapshots of testing distribution, what we have, which is going to be a booth, right? Uh, we were talking about snapshotting. It's snapshotting of your complete system, what you are working with now. So whenever you have installed all the packages and data. Sorry, I just meant to, to make the distribution available to other researchers, essentially a blend that is it's not based on Debian stable, but instead a snapshot based on uh, so testing. What, what would we... Can you stand up, please? Oh, uh, people have seen me probably. The, uh, um, what, we, what we do is um, we, that virtual machine, we do nothing to it. We add, other than adding the line to the sources list and run up, get update for the first time. And other than that, it's plain Debian stable. And since it runs in this virtual environment, there's really nothing that it couldn't do, right? And, and people just download it, and, and then they click on the seamless mode, and it vanishes, and they have Mac OS, and they're amazed, and they run their software that they need, and they have no clue how it works internally. But the machines are so powerful that you don't have to tell them, right? And, and we found that the performance is really, for most of the things, exactly the same. So as he mentioned, we, we ran a, a a course on, on um, multivariate pattern analysis of neural data on a Mac OS uh, computer lab running Debian, and you really don't have to do anything. It's, it's quite a versatile thing. You have nothing to do with it. Uh, okay, so the freshness of your software is controlled by you adding a line to, app, to the sources list. Oh yeah, no, what, what we do in addition, obviously, is we, we backport all the stuff that we upload to Unstable also for LAN, right? And we build it there, and it's in that repository. And if eventually, you know, getting into backports.org will become easier for people like me who are Debian maintainers, then we can also do it there. But right now, it would all go through him, and then he doesn't see his kids anymore. So, so you should become a Debian developer. Yeah. So he. Yeah, yeah. it's my fault. <laughs> Further questions? 
I have a comment. Uh, oh, yeah. So I have a comment. So everything, as a upstream guy, uh, if, if any of you here are also uh, source developers, you want Yorick to package your stuff. He is, he is very good. What, what, are, what are your upstream ones? Oh, uh, a bunch of debuggers. One for Bash. What is it? One for Can You Make? I don't know. What are they? <laughs> well, <laughs> what languages do you know? <laughs> Adam? Hi, just wanted to comment on two of the things that you said uh, if, uh, described as future development or, or um, oh sure, future, future, future development or, or things that would be nice to have. Uh, one is installing multiple versions. Uh, the, there's already the update alternatives. I'm sure you're aware of this. Uh, is, is that something that you just haven't tried or are or, or just not, uh, or it doesn't meet your needs uh, in some way? And, and the other is, is, is testing. There is, uh, as, as you identified, no real uh, kind of testing or uh, regression testing of packages infrastructure in Debian right now. I uh, wonder if we could talk about that a little bit if, or if you have any ideas. So um, update, update alternatives is, is, is nice. And, and, and if, you, if you use it for a few tools, then it's, it's also convenient. But for things like FCL, which really have lots of interdependencies with lots of things. You cannot just combine one version with anything else. So we, we need to have a way to have them available at the same time with their, in their respective environments. And then usually what people do is they, they, they also rely on repo scripts that set up a specific environment for that specific version with another configuration. And it's complex. And then there are things that are you know, packaged by upstream in a way that you don't even know what version you're running. <laughs> and if they release a new version, they don't change the version. And you wouldn't know unless you figure out you know, what, what they actually changed. And, and that's really hard to package that in a way that you can support that if upstream doesn't want to. And sometimes they just don't want to, although people want to use it that, that way. So we, we can go as far as, as, as we can do it with upstream. Because at some point, the, the patch size is so large that you can't you know, responsibly do this anymore. Because most of the things, FCL is the rare exception, they don't have uh, regression tests. And we repeatedly run into the issue that we do good in the Debian sense, right? If we remove uh, convenience copies and link it in a slightly different way, right? And then, then the T distribution doesn't look like T distribution anymore. And then, then you know, some head needs to be chopped off if that gets published. And it's not upstream's head because their software works, right? So and, and so you need to, to you know have a cutoff where you say okay then it doesn't go into them because they don't want it and and if we succeed and that becomes as popular you know in in that specific special interest field then we hope to generate enough of, enough of interest of upstream people to get into it and and even with that single presentation at that native conference it seems to already have generated a lot of interest so people now. We always came begging and say, oh, wouldn't it be nice if you, hmm? And now they come and say, oh, uh, I have this software. It's been downloaded 80,000 times from the NITRC.org. And they say, can, you, can we get that in there somehow? And sure you can. And then they're motivated enough and you can you give them the to-do list what, what they need to do to comply to the FSG standards. And then they just do it and you get it into that. It's as easy as that if, if they you know, have interest. I, I got a follow-up question on that. I mean, is it very difficult for them? Because I have the experience or I have the feeling that a lot of that research software stuff, sometimes the copyright isn't very clear. You mean there's like various people from various groups collaborating on it and then I've seen a couple of really good, in my field, software popping up lately which have a GPL tag on it. It seems to be People do it by default now, but I mean, I know that there was various professors from various groups, and I don't believe that everybody really signed on the GPL. Maybe then somebody had the code and just stick it on. Is that something that you can enforce, or is it easier in your case because there's one institution which retains the copyright and they can just change it, or how's that working? Or is it, are you not looking that hard? Well, we have to look I'm, that hard, right? <laughs> the, the, the thing is, there is one package which we're trying to package since four years now, and they're working on the license. And they're clearly violating everything that we know about free software. They, it's, 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 it was closed source, now it's open source, but the license 
permits you even from downloading prior to agreeing to something, and they use GPL software inside. So if we would be of the, the neuroscience busy box, we would be very busy in court, right? Mm. But it's, it, that doesn't make any sense, yeah. in, at least in this field, right? It's a couple of people who develop software, and it's, it's not them who make those decisions, it's the licensing agencies of their universities who pretty much have no clue and, and, and so they have to spend their valuable time, which they cannot do research in, to try to figure out, right? And, but at some point, a lot of them have sold their souls to this university administrative layer. And it, 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 it's probably social work to figure it out and not court work. Um, and the second question for me, um, is there a neuros neuroimaging task already, or how did you collaborate with well, Andreas for that, or are you just using? We have a few. Let's put it this way. First right. of all, we have that's the problem, somewhat of problem of tasks in blends that they are not orthogonal. Some software right. could be present, many of them, right? Yes. So we can and put in a new one for neuroimaging specifically. It also doesn't make sense. Although there is one, there is imaging and imaging death, and they've been met. There is also cognitive neuroscience, no, cognitive science or cognitive neuroscience, neuroscience in Debian. Yes. It's so, for more. And it, that one is Debian science. Okay. So. I think what would be really nice is, just one sec, um, because one problem with the task so far is that once, it would be nice if you could say, okay, neuro, Debian net is these four tasks, and then you, they could just collapse them and look at the, these tasks or stuff, because for example now, I think the biology task is basically just Debian Met Bio, and it's just one meta package, so it doesn't really make sense to click on that, so there is some problems. But I mean, one thing that, I mean, Andreas told me that, so for example, for Debicam, we now finally have the tasks in, Sid, and he said, well, we could also put it on the release notes when, when squeeze release once it's in, so that might be also something interesting for you. Just having your stamp on and maybe getting quite some exposure on, on the release notes. If, if I don't know whether Andreas will actually manage to do that, but it's something for you to consider, I would say. The, the thing is that, um, so we have all those tasks, and that the web page you've seen, that's generated by a few lines of Python code. It right. just gets them from SVN, it, get, it talks to UDD through DDE, and asks for the bits that, that we need. So and we have that tailored view. Doing the same thing in the, in the, with the tasks interface would mean we would pretty much copy half of it and maintain it in addition, right? And then it would be hidden somewhere behind. And, that, and of course we could do that with neurodebian.net and then add to that. But that would mean we would need to make it talk to our repository as well, right? And that's right, okay, because yeah. it lists also that and, and mm. also the stuff that, that can never go into Debian. How are you actually, uh, are you using uh, maybe I missed that. Are you using subversion.debian.org or git.debian.org for Every, maintaining? Ev everything, all the packaging, the website code is all an alias but in git.debian. Okay, right. Git. So Debian. then I think it's no problem for the tasks thing to just no. take that. But Okay, there was some more. Yeah, Thomas had another question. Sorry. I've got a question. You talked about uh, the, the virtual machines that people are using. So are the users are happy running this stuff in a virtual machine? Or do you think that a sort of a live CD would attract more people so they can just try it? Well, they can easily try it with NeuroDev, uh, with virtual machine, right? If some people had difficulty running it for some reason, then they just installed Debian in virtual machine. And then put one line in apt, and they were happily users since after. Um, we were going to do a little research to trying to figure out either someone migrated from virtual machine into native running Debian, but we haven't done that yet. But many people quite satisfied. Some people have a not pleasant experience with running it on Vista or some new 64-bit, 7, know. Windows 7, right? But in, in, in general, they are very happy. And, and we have the situation that, that the people who, who use the stuff, do the stuff, are PhD students and they have no choice what they, what they should run their stuff on. Even if they know that Debian is the best, they need to struggle with you know, Red Hat or, God forbid, Windows, right? And then those, those go crazy if they download the virtual machine and then it just does it, what, whatever they want. And, and if, they, if they go into seamless mode with a virtual box, they don't even you know, think about that. You know, they know it for a week 
and then it may just use it. There is, though, initial resistance sometimes. Um, what I want to say, I think it's a very, very good example that you um, make a pass between the Debian development and the users. And I think uh, a lot of parts or people inside Debian could learn from you that we can do things much better like the web page. I think it's really great, um, the example, can you find where to a certain part of software and your web page is much more comfortable for all the users. And I think it's also very important to have people inside Debian that have contact to the de developers, but also to the users. So thank you for this project, and I hope a lot of people will have a look at the video of the talk, and uh, more people in different um, topics would do the same work as you do. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, you had, there was one last question. Yeah, no, I, I wanted just to comment on the issue live CD against uh, VirtualBox. Um, I have some experience on giving uh, Python schools, and um, we were using a, a live CD uh, system for the students, and, but now I'm, we decided to switch to VirtualBox because with the live CD, of course, you typically have, the, for example, the firmware problem for the wireless uh, cards and this kind of stuff. So you, for the average laptop, you're pretty sure it will work and they will, be, will like Debian and maybe will decide to switch at some point, but the VirtualBox is just much less invasive and you are pretty sure that it will work everywhere. And this is the final selling point. Okay, then I think we should leave it at this. We can still discuss later for things. I already noted some stuff we might discuss in a round table from your talk. And uh, we'll be back in like five minutes with uh, new developments in Debian packaging, lightning sort of talks. See you in a bit.